There are interviews where I say that I could very well end up in jail, and my prophecy came true, I did. I am a pioneer on the forefront of this thing, one of the first 10 people who even knew what Bitcoin was. I'm a capitalist, I wanted to make money. That's what we did. We just built a company to make us money. I had this Bitcoin celebrity status. I had a party lifestyle. I've also made the mistakes and I've seen the red flags. Where's this all means for, uh, for Bitcoin? No comment. We are the reasons that Bitcoin is where it is today. And that's something that'll be my legacy. And it's something worth fighting for. My name is Charlie Shrem. I was an early founder and pioneer in the Bitcoin space. And it was a, a very humbling experience being a you know, multimillionaire to washing dishes for $8 an hour and no tip. I met Charlie at a Bitcoin conference. He had a very high profile in the community. So as a prosecutor, if you can achieve one conviction that has a huge ripple effect in the community, that is the person you go after. So this is the front porch and everything. I can't leave here, I can't go past here. If I do, SWAT team will come. Let's go back inside. Charlie Schramm, he was one of the first entrepreneurs in Bitcoin. He built a real business when a lot of other people were trying to figure out what can you do with this stuff? And he got in over his head. This is my beautiful ankle jewelry. BitInstant was one of the early Bitcoin companies. So it was a way to get Bitcoins and dollars around the world. 30 to 35% of all Bitcoin transactions were, were going through our system. The ability to do that was amazing. The tech industry is full of people that want to move fast and break shit. And you can't do that in fintech. Charlie Schramm, 24 years old, arrested today and charged. I allowed and enabled a customer of BitInstant to buy Bitcoin when I knew he was going and reselling these Bitcoins on Silk Road. Silk Road was that infamous black market drug website, often referred to as essentially the eBay for drugs. I knew it was illegal, but I don't think I cared enough at the time to, to, to stop it. In prison, you become a number. So no matter how rich or poor you are on the outside, no matter what you did on the outside, you are in khakis and you are a number. I've had a year to reflect and to take a break, and I am more into Bitcoin and blockchain technologies as I ever was. Now he's out, and he's paid his debt to society, and he's, um, he's trying new things. This is my first public appearance since I've been arrested in January. Very, very tough crowd in there because they're not Bitcoiners, they're bankers. But we're excited to, to show them the light, to preach the gospel in there. As a software purist, I believe in open source software and I believe that everyone should see all of the code. And that's exactly what Bitcoin is. The mechanisms surrounding Bitcoin prevent unnecessary hyperinflation and the arbitrary printing of money. So it's a true, pure market, all built on the blockchain. So blockchain technology is not just money. It's a whole new infrastructure. The blockchain is simply a chain of blocks. It's a ledger system where thousands of transactions every second get packaged into a block. But instead of having one company maintain that ledger, that ledger is actually maintained across everyone's computers in real time. It's decentralized real-time accounting. Bitcoin gives people economic freedom. And that's why it's a super amazing thing. It has no center of gravity, it has no headquarters, you can't shut it down. The only way you could is to shut off the internet. The story that Charlie Shrem is a part of is the decentralization of finance. Charlie was one of the first people to help that along in the most basic of ways, helping people get money from point A to point B without, without an intermediary. Right now I'm in New York, and what I'm going to be doing is sitting on a panel with Marco Centuri. It's a crazy time in the blockchain space. 2016, 2017 will be known as some of the formidable years in the Bitcoin and blockchain space. As the months go by since my release from prison, the tech community, not just the Bitcoin community, but the tech community as a whole, have really embraced me back. Thank you. Congrats, man. Thank you. Good I appreciate to have you it. Back. The most supportive community in the whole world is the Bitcoin and blockchain community.
I have a much bigger appreciation for the small things. We'll be doing something and I'll remember like how I couldn't do it before and I'll be like, you know, like this is freedom. And like, we'll always take a toast to freedom. Bitcoin is back with a vengeance, baby. If you look back at the early days of Bitcoin and you look at the people who made a lot of money or that made a name for themselves, those are people who were a little bit crazy and you had to have a little bit of vision. And I think crazy people who have vision that end up being right aren't called crazy people who have vision that ended up being right. They're called visionaries. We're building worldmeter.io, and uh, we hope it to be ready at the beginning of 2017. Um, and by then, we will already have connected a lot of power plants. Um, so you will you will go on this. You see the world, and you see um, you see information actually that is open by regulation. So you won't see information that is private, and you can search that information due, because we enrich that information with semantic data. Every data point is searchable. So what you potentially could search for is um, uh, world meter, show me um, solar power plants that are producing energy to the contrary to each other. So it would probably spit out Chile and Serbia. I would say every time in Chile produces um, uh, uh, energy out of solar, it does not in Serbia and vice versa. So what can you do with that is you can start to insure the sun because you can hedge the countries against each other. What does that mean? It means that you need less equity uh, for building, a pro uh, for building a power plant because somebody ensures your revenue. And that is only the beginning, just to give an idea. So when you log in, you see your data and only you see your data. Now that, that is nothing new because SCADA systems can do that. But what is more interesting, and this is, this is, this is the MIST browser, so this is not our browser, this is the browser of Ethereum, just to give, an, uh, to give an idea how that might look like. So what we have been working on in the last two years was different applications. And there will be different applications. It will be decentralized apps, proprietary apps, and certified apps by regulators or um, um, different, let's say, market makers. So a very simple app is asset performance monitoring. Show me how my, my asset was working. The other one is, um, I'm a solar power plant. Um, please show me how I'm, 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 I'm performing compared to my neighbors. And if, if I'm underperforming, I might have forgotten to put down the panel, uh, the snow down from the panels. Uh, project development, secondary market. So, so operation maintenance is predictive maintenance. So Andritz is building an app. If you have a hydropower plant and you give me your performance uh, data, I can, out of my know-how, which I have internally, uh, predict you the lifetime of the turbine. I can tell with which percentage compared to other power plants, uh, which bearing gonna break when. Now this is nothing new. Uh, many other companies can do that as well uh, with that platform. Andreds might not even know which power plant it is, which they're analyzing. So out of that operation maintenance, uh, because the data can be reused, uh, what happens is you, you, you have a technical due diligence because the data, the interpretation was done in real time, and this real time interpretation was also hashed on the blockchain. So it means out of this technical due diligence, that data can be reused by another third party which make, makes a financial due diligence. And then you have a real-time asset valuation. It means on the secondary market app, what you could do is if you want to sell or if you want to refinance your power plant, you just put it up there. And uh, somebody who wants to invest or refinance you, he can do, make the due diligence online because the data was recorded when the data happened. So um, the other one is forecast and then energy trading platform, virtual power plants, uh, Belensky Group Accounting, as I told you before, microgrid management, trading bot, uh, which we called white label utility. So we have designed a trading bot. Um, it's by far not possible to deploy that yet, but we just wanted to see if it works or not. That someday in the future, um, every household can download a trading bot, and that trading bot makes this house a single trade in the market. And you can tell to this bot, um, I only want to have green energy or I just want to have the cheapest energy. And that trading bot you could also download on the Tesla and the Tesla trades by itself when it's connected to the grid. It should know if you want to use it or not and when. Yeah. 
So there is a lot of different applications. For example, emission certificate generation, that is not more than 20 lines of code. And the project that I wanted to show you is um, actually a project um, on the consumer side, because most of these applications I've shown here are, let's say, on the generation side. And uh, actually, you can rebuild every business model in a different app. And uh, because we are connecting a lot of power plants right now, um, by building an app, you don't have the, to do the integration, uh, to, to vertical integration to the power plants. You immediately have those power plants available as potential customers. Uh, Lauren here right now, um, he's actually right now in South Africa, and we're going to call him now. And I just want to show you where it is, where he is in Johannesburg at a school. Lauren, could you shortly explain uh, what, uh, where you are and, and, and what you're doing there? Sure. Okay, so um, I'm in a, a city outside of Johannesburg in South Africa. It's called Soweto, which uh, stands for Southwestern Townships. And um, it's a city that is, uh, uh, the reason it's here is due to the legacy of segregation and apartheid. And in fact, it's very close, where I am right now, it's very close to where Nelson Mandela used to live in his youth. And I'm in a small school um, in the middle part of Soweto. And uh, uh, what uh, I'm standing here, the reason there's a light is because I've got my car headlamps on, but it's actually dark. Um, and I'm going to be showing you and uh, we're going to be demonstrating uh, our blockchain prepaid metering system. Should I give you a, uh, an overview of the, of the project? Yes, please. Okay, so uh, for many years I was a, um, building smart grid solutions uh, for the African uh, uh, population. And uh, what we were doing is we were building um, a lot of prepaid vending systems because there's a massive drive in, in, in Africa to replace the postpaid metering system with prepaid. Um, the reason for that is because it's very difficult to uh, recover the costs of the, uh, in the utility consumed, in this case energy, uh, after the fact. You know, so if somebody consumes it, it's difficult to actually get uh, them to pay for it for a lot of reasons. So there's now a massive drive to roll out prepaid metering throughout uh, uh, South Africa and Africa. But that now has uh, introduced a whole new set of problems. Because 80% of Africans are unbanked. They don't have uh, access to banking services. So they live uh, entirely in a cash economy. And that means that paying for anything really is uh, very difficult. You know, they, they have to carry cash and uh, it, uh, it's insecure and it generally increases costs. And uh, the same is for uh, prepaid metering. So now um, what happens is uh, if they want to make purchases for electricity, they have to physically carry cash to a vendor that's uh, allocated somewhere and uh, buy a token and then go and load those meters um, or, to, or do the, the vending remotely. Uh, now, we struggle to find ways to actually get those, uh, those vendors nearby the, uh, the actual uh, customers. Also, a prepaid vending system the, makes the, the energy a lot more expensive because those vendors need infrastructure and um, also there's traveling costs and uh, it's very inconvenient as well to um, make those payments. You can imagine if you're in a remote area and your lights go out, now you need to, you know, there's no way you can actually make a payment because there's no easy uh, electronic way of, of doing that. So while we were busy uh, uh, dealing with this problem, I, I was very interested in Bitcoin and I thought, you know, this is the perfect solution. Uh, it's the, you know, a, an electronic currency that the, no banking is required. Um, and also, you know, in Africa, there's, uh, the, the mobile adoption is, is very widespread. So I built it into the system. And um, then I just thought, well, hang on, you know, uh, maybe we can do this instead of just for that particular system, we can actually roll this out and make it available to other vendors as well. Lauren, I just, I'm, I'm, yep. I'm, so I'm sending now a Bitcoin. Can you show the meter? Yes, now, okay, so now as I'm going to go to the classroom and uh, there's uh, some teachers there and, uh, and it's all dark and, and uh, it's going to now make the, the transaction. So let me just head on down there. Tell me when I should so make the transaction. Yes, yeah, sure. So I'm just going to head down to the, the classroom now. Are you alone there? Is somebody else there? No, there's a lot of people, well, not with me at this moment, but there's a lot of people that we're about to 
see uh, the principal is here and there's some teachers, um, some uh, staff. How long it's going to take you? Sorry, give me, give me another 30 seconds. 30 20 seconds. seconds, okay. How long does the transaction uh, take? It takes 30 seconds. The transaction seconds. takes about, it should take about 30 seconds. Now what I've done is I've lowered the, the confirmation to zero, so it's not going to take a full 10 minutes to actually do the transaction. Okay, All here right. I am. Okay, I'm not getting back. You know? All right. Should I send it? Go for it. Okay, I hope I have the right address. <laughs> Continue. Sending one okay, Bitcoin, so, 400 euro. Okay, so we're now in, in one of the classrooms. It's payment sent. Okay, well now we wait, I guess. And we hope it works. It worked today morning, no? You know, in a live demo. <coughs> so anyway, now what's happening is it's now going through the blockchain. The meter is going to detect the payment. It's going to calculate the tariff and then load the required amount of electricity onto the, the meter. It's, there's nothing on it at the moment, that's why we're in the dark. And uh, hopefully in a few seconds the meter should be activated. I'm not just sitting in one of the classrooms here, so you're going to see uh, the staff. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> just remember, normally in a, in, a, in a Bitcoin payment there's a, a 10 minute confirmation cycle. So normally there's about uh, an hour for a full confirmation, six confirmations. Oh, there we go. Oh my god. Hey! Hey Lauren, now the party starts or what? Okay. Like they want to sing your song. Okay, cool. So I, I, I'm, we are actually also now finished, and we also can have a beer now. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Lauren. And thank you, guys.